Could you hear me? Great. Hi. Can you hear? Hi. Can you hear? Hello, John. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So did you talk to Great. Great. Hey guys, uh, welcome to the uh, Elvig meeting. Uh, Zen couldn't make it, like his visa didn't get here in time, so I'm just sitting in. And uh, I have like a sitting in co-chair as well. Hi everyone, my name is Jean. I'm the on-site volunteer and have to <laughs> manage this session. And due to many reasons, so the two chairs are not here. Yeah. So thanks, uh, so let's get started. Uh, I think uh, Jen, the co-chair Jen, will remotely manage the session. So uh, now we uh, let Jen to start. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Jin and Switch. And uh, I'm sorry that I could not make it in Chicago this time. Uh, but I really found Mikiko is a uh, wonderful. Actually. Uh, from some aspect, it's even better than I appear on site because uh, I can be on screen and uh, it seems that you can see me more clearly than uh, you can see me on site. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, so. Let's switch to the topic right now. So we uh, so this is the L week uh, working group meeting. And uh, could you go to the next slide? Okay, this is not well. Please make sure that you, you are aware of the uh, the policies uh, specified here. Next one. Uh, so, uh, I think we find many stakers and uh, we'll do the work on the collaborative editing page listed here. And uh, make sure that uh, you, have, you assign the blue sheet and uh, which has been passed by Jim before the session. Uh, so um, we have a GitHub. So so we have a GitHub page right now, and uh, thanks a uh, custom for handling that for uh, for us. And uh, we have moved uh, some of the draft to the GitHub homepage so that we can do some uh, collaborative editing of the uh, draft including the you can you can do either the working group draft or uh, the individual draft there yeah. next one so this is the uh, the status of the working group right now and uh, for the first draft uh, mentioned here is the uh, how efficient uh, guidance document. So we have uh, shared our, our document shaper assigned and the write up is ready. And we will move uh, uh, during and after this session. And for the second one is the crypto draft. We, uh, this draft has been under review, but we have received some comments and uh, we are waiting for some decisions uh, on the list to clear up all the uh, issues we found and uh, the concerns of the draft and uh, so that we can uh, see how we can move forward. And for co-web co draft, I, uh, this is uh, some ongoing work right now because this draft has actually expired for a while. But I, I recently go through this draft and uh, really found that uh, this uh, has some uh, import, important guidance, useful guidance for the implementers. I think this is a uh, uh, something that uh, is good for the co-implementers and the community. Uh, 
And then it's the TCP constraint uh, network guidance document with which will be presented uh, at this meeting. So uh, next one, please. So this is our agenda today. So we we have uh, actually we have received uh, three uh, talks, but uh, uh, the third one also has some uh, conflict with uh, IP second E session. So uh, which we could not make it uh, present at L week this time. So we actually have uh, we handled two talks today. The first one is the TCP over uh, constraint nodes network from uh, Canada's uh, uh, governments. And the second talk is the label management policy and the guidance for the low power of 10, but, uh, which is a work in video draft uh, from Rahul, Simon, and uh, Joaquin. So that, next one, please. Yes. Uh, the then I had a question, like uh, regarding energy efficient, right? Like, so are you going to uh, push the publication request on that so it gets to me? Yeah, I can hear you. So, uh, so what's your what's your question? Uh, regarding Elvig energy efficient, the draft. Yeah. Uh, Moit has done the Shepherd write up. So, are you going to push the request for publication soon, or what's the plan? Yeah, the plan is to push it to publication. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thanks. Okay, a any other question from the room? No, that's good. Okay, no, so okay. I think we can. Then, uh, Jim, please help to uh, ask the presenters to, to the stage. Yeah, okay, now let's move to the first presentation. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carlos Gomez, and I'm going to present the last update of the draft entitled TCP over constrained uh, node networks. Uh, my co author is John Crocroft from the University of Cambridge. Okay, thank you. Next, please. Okay, so first of all, let's take a look at the status for this document. Uh, the initial version of the draft was presented in Berlin in both uh, LWIC and TCPN uh, working group meetings. So after publication of this initial version of the draft, there was a lot of feedback received, which led to the publication of version 01, which was presented in, in Seoul. So after that, uh, we received uh, a lot of very good comments from uh, Michael Sharp, who's TCPN co-chair. So the last update of the document is dash 02, which I'm presenting today. And this version mostly addresses the comments kindly provided by Michael. Next, please. Okay, so first of all, uh, let's take a quick look at the motivation for the draft. So today we have that there are several application layer protocols that are being used for several Internet of Things scenarios. So we have constrained application protocol coap, which was originally designed over UDP. However, uh, there's a coap over TCP specification in progress. The main reason being the need to overcome problems with uh, middle boxes, which are not so friendly sometimes to, to UDP traffic. So it means TCP is uh, being used in this case. Then we also have that HTTP 2 and even HTTP 1.1 have been used or are being considered for several IoT scenarios, so TCP is uh, used here again. Sorry. Sorry. Is anybody following Jabber? I'm taking the notes, but I hope someone is following Jabber. So who is willing to uh, be the Jabber subscriber? Hmm. OK. Then um, we have Further application layer protocols, such as XMPP, which are sometimes used also in IoT scenarios, 
and XMPP also relies on TCP at the transport layer. And we also have non-ITF application layer protocols such as MQTT, which also use TCP. So a conclusion here is that TCP is being used or will be used in many IoT scenarios. However, TCP had been quite neglected uh, for IoT scenarios, at least here in the ITF. So the purpose of this document is to offer simple measures for suitable TCP implementation and operation for uh, constrained node networks. Next, please. Okay, so let's go through the updates in this version of the document. First of all, the intended status of the document is now informational. Actually, this is something that had been agreed earlier. However, uh, the change has been applied right now. So it means that the purpose of the document is to report, to explain how TCP can be configured uh, in a suitable way for the scenarios uh, we are considering. Then uh, one section of the document that has been updated is section two, which is entitled Characteristics of CNNs Relevant for TCP. Here we have added uh, the explicit definition of constrained node networks. This is literally taken from RFC 7228. And the main reason for this is the fact that a reader uh, might have the, the question, the doubt uh, about whether the guidance in this document applies only to six low pan or six low networks or uh, which is actually the scope. So the scope of this guidance is any network which conforms to the definition of uh, constrained node networks. Then another section we have updated is uh, the one about uh, the TCP maximum segment size. So in previous versions of the document, there was uh, there were some recommendations about the fact that some six low pan or six low links define an MTU uh, of 1280 bytes. And then the idea is to avoid IP layer fragmentation, the TCP MSS has to be set accordingly. For example, avoiding to exceed uh, to 120 bytes. However, uh, we have added in this version of the document that there are some further uh, links, link technologies, which are used in the constrained node network space, such as, for instance, MSTP uh, 802.11ah or narrowband IoT, to name a few, which support greater MTUs. So in this case, the TCP MSS may be set to greater values uh, without uh, incurring IP layer fragmentation. Although, of course, we have to be careful uh, to, to adjust correctly the, the TCP MSS to the specific value for each link. Next, please. Another section we have updated discusses uh, the window size of TCP. So in previous versions of the document, uh, we were actually uh, stating or recommending use of a single MSS window as a way to reduce complexity of the implementation. However, we have modified the, the approach, the, the writing of this, and now what we say is we, we just explain that a TCP stack can reduce implementation complexity by advertising a TCP window size of a single MSS and uh, can also use uh, a transmit uh, window size of a single MSS. And we explain that, okay, if you do this, then uh, this reduces complexity, but also it reduces performance in some aspects such as throughput, for instance. So instead of a recommendation, now we have this explanation. Next, please. Another section that has been updated is the one about RTO estimation. So we have added some discussion about the fact that if a small TCP window size is used, uh, then there will be mechanisms such as fast retransmit, fast recovery, or selective acknowledgements, which maybe cannot be used. And that means that uh, the RTO algorithm will probably have a larger impact on performance than otherwise. And that's because uh, retries will be actually triggered by expiration of the RTO. This also opens the door to uh, adapting or uh, tuning the, the RTO algorithm. However, this has to be done carefully because there exists some fundamental trade-off 
behind the RTO, which is that an aggressive RTO behavior reduces the wait times uh, before retries. However, it also increases the probability of incurring spurious timeouts. So uh, this might lead to uh, unnecessarily wasting scarce resources, such as energy or bandwidth, uh, which is something that we need to take care about. Next, please. So still in the same section about RTO estimation, we still talk briefly about the COCO RTO algorithm. However, we do it now as a related note. So COCO RTO is the advanced uh, RTO algorithm that's being defined in the core working group for the COAP protocol that's defined for operation over UDP. Um, so the text here is now just as a related note for informational purposes. Um, however, uh, it's probably still beneficial for a, a reader uh, to find that this algorithm has been evaluated and compared actually with the TCP RTO algorithm and also some state-of-the-art uh, TCP-based RTO variants. And because COCO has been specifically designed for IoT scenarios, it appears to outperform these other algorithms. Then another section that has been updated is the one about delayed acknowledgements. So now uh, we explain without making particular assumptions about whether some scenarios are more common or not than others. Uh, we explain that delayed acknowledgements are not recommended for scenarios with mostly transactional type of traffic with transaction size of at most uh, one MSS. That's because uh, delayed acknowledgements would just contribute delay here. There would be no benefit. And uh, on the other hand, delayed acknowledgements could be useful to reduce the number of acknowledgements sent if uh, an appropriate window size is used uh, in scenarios with bulk transfers. So this could be uh, positive uh, to save resources such as energy and bandwidth in constrained node networks. Uh, so one of the changes has been uh, to remove any particular assumption about whether these scenarios or the scenarios are more common than others or not. Next, please. We have also added text to the security considerations section. So uh, there are TCP options that improve security, such as, for instance, MD5 signature option or TCP authentication option, TCP AO. However, security comes at the cost of increased overhead and complexity. So we need to be aware of this. And for example, MD5 adds 18 bytes per TCP segment. And TCP AO typically has a size of 16 to 20 bytes. So uh, this is something relevant uh, in the scope of devices which are energy limited because every additional byte that we are transmitting or receiving is going to consume a possibly significant amount of energy. Next, please. So, uh, finally, the document has an annex which has the purpose of uh, reporting the main characteristics of lightweight TCP implementations. And um, we have added in this version uh, this table that you can see in the slide, which, by the way, is not yet complete. This is in progress. But you can see that the purpose is to allow some quick uh, identification of which are the uh, features supported or not by the different lightweight TCP implementations. And also, uh, the idea would be to, to collect uh, requirements in terms of uh, memory for each TCP implementation. As you can see also, um, the sections about Riot and OpenWSN are currently empty. So uh, we'd also like to, to make a call to the working group so that if anyone is familiar with details on these speci specific implementations, or maybe uh, and someone considers that the table should be expanded with additional lightweight TCP implementations, please uh, get in touch with us and, and let us know. Next, please.
Rahul Jadav from Huawei Technologies. Uh, in the draft, you have mentioned even the TCP fast op open option. Uh, and so my question is, uh, are you even considering scope of all the different options? I mean, all the different options which TCP supports as part of this draft and check whether it is applicable to constant networks. Like for example, TCP fast open is mentioned. So, but there are a lot of other variants that can also be, that are also applicable. And along with those applicability comes uh, security considerations as well. So I'm going to also take care of those points in this draft. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood correctly what you mean. So, for example, uh, we, we mentioned TFO as a way to solve the problem that you may have middle boxes in the end-to-end -end communication. So, um, the, the idea is, okay, to, to describe the, the options of TCP that can be relevant um, because someone will have to implement TCP in a lightweight, in a, in a constrained device. So, uh, there are several options in TCP. So the idea would be to report the, the main ways how uh, the TCP implementation can be uh, configured in a suitable way for some specific scenario, which comprises the characteristics of a specific device, characteristics maybe of, of the network, of requirements from the application. So the idea would be to, to collect the most relevant information, of, at least from the main options. Uh, so, uh... So when it comes to TCP fast op open option, let's talk about this specifically. So what what is the draft considering here? Are we trying to say that uh, TCP fast option uh, uh, fast open option might be more relevant towards constrained networks because sort of sense the data along with the. So uh, what are we trying to conclude there in that? Uh, well, so the document is informational, so. We are not kind of mandating anything. That's a first thing to consider. So the purpose is to explain that a way to avoid having to establish a new TCP connection every time a sensor is sending some data is to use TFO. So uh, you, you embed data uh, within the SIM packet. So that's a way to, to avoid this and uh, to avoid the problem with a uh, middle box that you might have in between. Uh, but once we specify the TCP fast open like option, then again, the security considerations, which are naturally, you know, you are inheriting the security complications as well. Those also have to be specified clearly here. Uh, so that would just be as an input from myself. Yeah, so um, th there's one, one aspect, which is uh, TFO requires some cookie, which has to be updated, for instance. And uh, yeah, we might add some details about uh, the refresh rates of that cookie, for example. So yeah. we, well, we can talk about the same mission. point. Or? Uh, yeah. Could you go back to the previous slide? Okay. Uh, I think Kerry was before you. So unless you want to talk on the same point, I'll let Kerry talk. <laughs> go ahead. It's 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 just re related, related to what, what what you said. So could you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So like. If you do security, you need more bytes. But what's the guidance here? Like, should I do this? Or should the guidance be that you should anyways have TLS or object security or scope on top of this and doesn't make sense to do this at this layer? Like, I think the point of the guidance document should be that here are these options. You don't need them because you should have security anyways above. But just the fact that saying, oh, if you do this, you you send more bytes on the network. I don't think that's like helps me as, as an implementer. Okay, well, thanks for the suggestion. So I think if you, can uh, provide input on this, uh, we will really welcome it. And yeah, so the idea is to, to explain, okay, which are the different options available, which is the impact. And of course, if we can provide uh, options about, uh, okay, if you use something else, maybe it's better, maybe it reduces the overhead, then that's of course beneficial. So one thing I want to add more like to that is that this is not a working group document yet, right? So like once it becomes a document, then it's up to the working group. Like it's not up to Carlos anymore, right? Like really to to see if the, there's guidance needed or not, right? And the working group decides it's going to go in. That's how I see it. Please. Kerry, go. Kerry Lynn. So Carlos, I really uh, thank you for this work. I think it's going to be important over time. Uh, I was the author of the MSTP draft that you referenced earlier that has the MTU of 1500 octets. Um, 
I found out pretty late in the game that, uh, and Eric can correct me if I'm wrong, but if uh, a node supports more than 1280, then it must be able to do path MTU. Uh, so I would say that in you know in your document, you should probably provide guidance that unless your application really has a strong reason to have uh, you know MTUs longer than 1280, you should probably stick with that assumption. Uh, because it wouldn't be, for example, to say here's you know we're, we're we're making a lightweight implementation of TCP, but it just pushes you know the complexity somewhere else. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Robbie Simpson. So first off, thank you. I'm so glad to see work on TCP on constrained networks. Um, <laughs> so uh, have you considered adding uh, anything about actual congestion control algorithms, right? So I know most of the world probably looks at new, new Reno and stuff like that, but there's a lot of intricacies when it comes to congestion control algorithms and potential guidance we could give for constrained networks. and. There's stuff even out there that might be more applicable to wireless, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the answer would be that not yet. Uh, so at this moment, uh, we have mainly been considering a quite binary approach, like uh, mainly inference because uh, there had been so many claims about TCP being complex and so on that, uh, okay, we said, well, maybe you can use a single MSS window that reduces complexity and that has some impact on uh, some mechanisms that will, know, will not have any effect. So uh, when we consider a window size greater than one MSS, then all of these uh, effects may come into place. So I think it's, it's relevant also to, to take a look at those. Yes. I'm happy to help. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Michael Sharp. I'm speaking as GTPM co-chair. So thanks a lot for this work. I think this is getting really useful. As a TCPM code chair, I think it's appropriate to uh, this being informational. Um, so I think this is a move in the right direction. And I also want to remind the working group, I mean, if you want changes in TCP, then please come to TCPM. So we own the protocol, but of course we welcome informational guidance in other communities. So um, definitely this heading is adding in the right direction. I can also confirm that quite a bit of my comments have been addressed. So I think this is really moving in a good direction. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Michael. And as side news, right? So, like at the last meeting, um, so I took an action item on myself to talk to the transport lady to find like a TCP co-author for this, and and thanks to Michael for agreeing to help like Carlos out like with this document. So uh, Michael will be joining as a co-author and help out on the uh, transport pieces of it. Thanks. Uh, Eric Nordmark. So yeah, in addition to confirming the MTU thing, right? That if you send above 1280, you have to be prepared to do path MTU discovery. And and if you want to go down that path, I don't know if you want to, but but whether one should then recommend to do packetization MTU discovery in TCP, as opposed to relying on the good old you know ICMP packet to big messages. I think that you know. So you mean 4821, the, Eric? What? I mean 4821. Whatever the number is, but title is packetization layer MTU discovery. Right? Um, so that I think would be good to pick a direction in that space. But the other one that sort of surprised me was this. Um, the There seems to be an implicit assumption that the TCP you're talking to is following the same implementation guidelines. When it comes to sending with a single packet, right? Having a window of a single packet only makes sense if you, the, the party you're talking to doesn't do any delayed acts. And by default, TCP implementations do delayed acts. So there, there seems to be a strong assumption here that your peer is doing LWIG as well. Because otherwise your, your, your maximum packet rate is uh, one packet every delayed act timer, which could be five packets a second, right? Which is not very impressive, even for a constrained device. So I think, uh, I, I should double check maybe, but I, I would say that delayed acts are a shoot. So, um, what a, it's yeah. not about what you implement, it's what your peer implement, and you can't control that, right? Okay, then I have to... Right, both ends are not implementing the same thing. They're both implementing TCP, but there's a wide range of allowed behaviors in TCP, and, and hence since, and most likely the peer you're talking to will be implementing, not implementing the Elvig, um, recommendations, but implementing standard TCP with delayed acts. So, so I think that 
the if you only care about sending a packet, a TCP packet once a day, the the one one packet buffer or uh, outstanding packet is okay. If you want to send 100 packets a second, you have to have more than one, right? Because otherwise, you're not going to get any throughput. So, and I think making that more clear, I think that that would be good. Yeah. So we will take this into consideration. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, so this actually a last slide. So uh, considering that the document is, at least the, the structure is starting to become stable and even the content itself. So uh, the authors of the document, we would like to ask to the working group whether you think that it is a good moment to adopt the document as a working group document. So then, if you're listening, like, uh, what do you think? You want to do the call hum now and then go on the list, or just take it on the list? Uh, yes, I'm. I'm here. So I think it's uh, based on the feedback from the audience uh, since Berlin. I think it's a good time to ask a, a appealing of this group for some confirmation. But one one. One thing is important that uh, as uh, Michael has uh, speak over the microphone, is, uh, we should have some TCPM authors also join the work so that we can make sure that uh, the recommendations in the draft is uh, in the right direction. Yeah, so uh, um, Michael is going to help out, right? Like, so uh, to make sure like it's, um, it doesn't like completely go far away from TCP, right, like plain TCP. So I think, um, so that taken care of is just like a procedural thing. Do you want to do this now or just on the list? That was my question, right? So do you want to do a hum first and then go confirm on list or do you want to just go on the list and do it after? I think we, we can do it right now. Okay. So, yeah, could you help handle it? Because I, I cannot see the room right now. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll do it. Okay, so um, how many people have read this draft? Including me. Okay. Uh, okay. I think there's not enough people in the room to make this call, but we'll take it on the list. So try, try to take a look at this draft, and uh, we'll set an adoption call on the list. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Okay, now let's go to the uh, second. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Rahul Jadov, and the talk is about, the presentation is about neighbor management policies for six slope and networks. I think this slide is not the latest one. I mean, this is not the slide that I sent. This is the slide from ITF 97. <laughs> Hello, Chen. Yeah, maybe you need to resend the slides to me. <laughs> this is the wrong right. side. I see ITF 97. Um, so, yeah. Uh, uh, do you think I laptop? can? Yeah? Or maybe you can use your laptop. Maybe. My laptop? Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm sorry, it's my mistake. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. So, for people who are following remotely, so there's an older version of the slide that was uploaded to the meeting material. So. Uh, the author is mailing new slides, and uh, Zen will upload them. So just uh, hold on for a couple of minutes. Thanks.
Then can you replace the slide and the meeting materials with the new one that you just got? Yes, I, I send that to Jin. So Jin, could you open your mailbox and see if you got the slide? Okay, uh, Raul, I think you need to go ahead with the, with the slides, okay? Can you, can you do the slides? Yeah, go ahead with the slides. Because the people remote are not going to be able to see it, right? So, okay. Hey guys, sorry for the people who follow remotely, like it's, uh, there's been some miscommunication between the presenter and the chair, so um, uh, we'll make sure it gets uploaded right after the meeting. By any chance, anyone knows how to change the screen to the projector? Sorry? Oh, we just project this. Both of them. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and sorry, everyone, for the delay. So this work was presented in IT of 97 in Seoul, and the the idea is about neighbor management policies in six low pan networks. So uh, in the last during the last talk, there was no draft. So we tried to check, get a general feedback from the working group 
whether it makes sense to work on this problem statement and we got an enormous uh, response uh, post which we have a draft now a working draft we have a, a individual submission here so yeah can you get it to full screen and then control l Sorry. Yeah. So, so what has changed since then? Uh, so uh, first things, uh, in the last presentation, what we had done was uh, we had presented a policy, a neighbor management policy. And what has changed since then is, apart from the policy, the signaling considerations, the signaling recommendations as to how to bring this policy into effect has been taken care of. So uh, let me begin uh, some of the slides I'm going to repeat here the neighbor management why neighbor management is required so in case of six low panel networks it is it is difficult to anticipate the maximum density of the nodes in a given network so how much of the table space do you allocate for the neighbor cache so that is the primary question that has been so whatever cache size you allocate at some point of time if the density is very high it's going to get uh, it's going to overflow so in that case, how are you going to handle the, what are the entries are you going to retain in the neighbor cache? Now prioritization based on the link quality estimation doesn't always work. In some cases, you might have to retain the cache entries which are more relevant. For example, it might not be advisable to evict an entry based on the direct child, uh, a routing child. So because what happens is, in, it, it has a ripple effect, ripple effect in terms of all the grandchilds are also evicted. So there, is a, a, th there are some implications in terms of which entries you can evict from the table. So there are some trivial neighbor management policies. One of them is LRU, another of it is uh, FCFS, first come first serve basis. Both of them have significant disadvantages and none of these algorithms will scale. Unfortunately, these are the algorithms that are currently implemented in most of the open sources. Expectation, the, ex, the final expectation of this neighbor management policy is that it should result in a stable network. So when I say stable network, the routing adjacencies should not change uh, periodically. I mean, it, it, without, without such a neighbor management policy, you will have a lot of churn with, between the neighbors and you won't ever get a stable routing adjacencies. Another thing is once the neighbor is accepted, it has to be guaranteed that all the resor associated resources are present to serve that neighbor. So, so, uh, one of, uh, so in, in the adjoining diagram, if you see there, what is mentioned is there is a heavily lopsided network in the first place and with the neighbor management policy, it sort of load balances the overall network. Now, one of the things that we t took into consideration while, uh, uh, while, while, while putting up a general guidelines is, this guideline should be protocol agnostic as far as possible. We, we, we didn't consider Ripple specifically or any key management protocol specifically, but we had to take some examples. So we, as an example, we have taken Ripple and both of its uh, mode of operations and Pana as a key or the key management protocol. Next slide, please. So we have considered a holistic approach towards uh, neighbor management. When I say holistic, apart from the routing protocol, we also consider the, the key management, the initial uh, key handshake procedure. Now that has serious implications on the neighbor cache management. So that is why it has to be taken into consideration. So in, in the sample example network that we have, the, uh, it's a PENA based uh, key authentication protocol, uh, key management protocol, which is, which is uh, which is what Wison has mandated. The draft also explains the different network management when it comes to RPL, what are the different options available, how to serve the different mode of operations for Ripple. So now what are the cases in which the neighbor table update happens? So first case is during initial key authentication, the relay element has to be selected. Now there is a relay element discovery here, Pana relay element discovery. So 
you need to uh, so when that discovery happens the pana client has to make an entry on behalf of the pre the pre has to make an element uh, has to make an entry on behalf of the pana client so the so th this is the this is the signaling that is involved so the, subsequently once the authentication is finished then the RP, ripple comes into picture there's a dio messaging there will be a parent node entry there will be a routing direct child entry so in the example that you have seen here if you see the p3 the node n3 has two routing direct uh, two routing parents and one routing child and one authentication se session in progress one more one more important thing while working on this draft that we had come across is the implicit versus ex explicit signaling what i mean is in case of constant network you don't want to add additional overhead in terms of uh, ns and uh, uh, ipv6 ndb procedures so as far as possible if it is possible for you to add the neighbor cache entries on behalf of existing signaling then that has to be used so this is what this is the signaling recommendation as part of this draft so when i say implicit signaling what i mean is the neighbor cache entries can be added as part of ripple signaling or as part of pana discovery signaling in certain cases it is not possible for example in case of ripple's non storing mode it is not possible to make such an entries in which case you have to work out a solution based on ipv6 ndp ipv6 ndp rfc 65 6775 already defines a procedure wherein you can send an ns with an arrow option if required to register an entry to re register a neighbor cache entry next slide please uh mohit just a quick comment so in 6 lo there is uh, work on uh, na neighbor discovery for constrained network so it would be good to see how this relates to that work there's work yeah. on uh, lightweight neighbor discovery secure lightweight neighbor discovery i think it will be presented in the 6 lo session is it tomorrow so it would be good to know how how this relates yeah so this so there are two considerations for this draft one is the signaling considerations and another is the policy how do you actually populate the table which all entries how do you retain the entries which all entries do you give the pri priorities so the signaling considerations we are not adding any new signaling here we are as per as possible depending upon the existing specifications from six low working group towards uh, doing the signaling but in certain cases we are recommending certain things for example in case of ripple if you directly use dio dao messaging to populate the neighbor cache entries then there is an uh, the additional overhead of ipv6 ndp messaging is saved so these are the so this is how it relates so what are the different man neighbor management operations so there are three primary operations the insertion eviction and the reinforcement so as part of insertion if if there is a simple logic as in if the table space is available insert now this is the this is the policy that is by default used in by most of the operating system so the major problem with this this particular policy is that in ca in case of ripple there is a multicast dio that is sent now if 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 all the nodes are going to add a neighbor cache entry based on this dio then it's going to overflow the table is going to overflow with all the parent entries similarly if the same parent is chosen by all the child nodes then the same parent will have all the dao entries coming to it and the neighbor cache entry will be overloaded with the routing direct child entries similarly for pre discovery it is the same procedure uh, procedure just that the stage is different in case of eviction like i mentioned in case of eviction if a routing child is evicted it not only impacts the routing child but it also impacts all the subsequent grant childs because in case of storing mode every all the child go to this goes via the same parent so it not only impacts that impacts that child but all the complete subtree behind beneath that child now one of the important consideration here is if you see the point where evicting non preferred parent and c now evicting non preferred parent neighbor cache entry is usually possible without much implications what i mean here is if there are 10 parents to be uh, that are available in the table neighbor cache entries then it is possible to evict one of the parent entries and make space available for some other 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 so my point is 
you can easily evict a non non preferred parent nc and make the space available for something else so now this is one of the considerations that we make use of when we when we apply the policy now, what is next the reinforcement the neighbor cache entries are going to be present in the table for quite some time so the this, so the link quality estimation has to be done on the periodic basis the do, uh, the draft does not make any the, the the draft does not define any specific procedure on how this link estimation is going to be done this is implementation specific the reinforcement part is mentioned here just for making sure that all the nodes have to all the all the implementations have to consider some sort of uh, reinforcement policy for example it might be a passive or active hearing or it might be explicit probing which is done by contic for example next slide please now clearing unused neighbor table entries now this is again important in, and in case of constrained node entries this is constrained node networks this is especially difficult because there is no explicit signaling when 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 a route changes for example or even if the route changes if there is an explicit signaling involved for, for example in the form of np dao it is easy to get uh, i mean it, it is not a very deterministic way of clearing up the entries so the point here is route invalidation is especially important and it uh, if if there is an optimized route in, invalidation procedure only in that case you will be able to clear up the unused nc's in case of non storing mode now as this is especially important because in case of non storing mode there is no np dao uh, there is no no part dao involved so how do you clear the entries in this case we have recommended making use of ns with lifetime of 0 which is as per rfc 6715 ipv6 ntp procedures in case of pre now the pre is a pre is a element which does not keep any state information on behalf of pana client so how do you how do you clear the entries so there is no way except that unless and until there are some clues available as part of the authentication procedure but since pr is completely stateless there is no such kind of clues are not available so the only way one of the way to evict the entries as soon as possible is to keep a different lifetime for such entries so you might have a lower lifetime for such authentication entries next slide please now this is one of a uh, part of the recommendation that is done by the draft what is the what is the signaling what is the signaling used for neighbor table, neighbor entry management so if you see there are three flows that are specified here pre discovery storing mode of operation rahul. and non storing mode of operation rahul yeah i think uh, you need to wind up I'm sorry okay yeah. so uh, basically what it says is that the, there is a way to do an implicit signaling as well as explicit signaling in case of uh, non storing mode of operation there is there is a requirement that you do an explicit signaling in the form of ns uh, with aro option while in case of non in, in case of storing mode of operation you can depend upon dio and dao messaging in case of pre discovery there is a unsecured ns for which you get a unsecured na so the, there is a difference between you know what kind of security is available at which stage next slide please so the sample policy now this is the one of the critical point here the sample policy is based on reservation so you have a table space you make a reservation for routing to direct childs as well as pre authentication sessions now if the parent elements can be occupied uh, the parent elements can be filled up in all the places because it is possible to evict those entries if required so the point is the the table space will be properly utilized in case routing childs are not available or authentication sessions are not available one of the things that is mentioned on this slide is about the graceful rejection of dao and pana messages so in case of implicit signaling it is important that there has to be some sort of rejection mechanism available in the signaling for example if you send a dao if the table is full there is a dao with negative acknowledgement present but in case of but similarly in case of pana signaling such a negative mechanism is not available this negative signaling is not available so you can't really use uh, pana discovery for as a impl implicit mechanism for signaling the next slide please yeah some of the issues uh, that we have faced is now this is a reactive policy you send a dao you send a ns and then it gets failed but what happens if the same 
uh, for example, if a parent notes neighbor cache is full and it sends a DIO, there is a good chance that some other child might come up and select that node as a parent. So how would this child come to know, child node come to know that the parent does not have enough space available? So uh, the, currently there is no way to know this because this is a re currently it's a reactive policy. So what we are recommending here is there might be some solution possible based on a proactive approach. For example, the NC, the neighbor cache entry metric has to be advertised as part of DIO. Hello, is this working? Yeah. Uh, uh, the NC metric has to be advertised as part of DIO messaging. Now, one more important thing here is that this proactive approach applies to not only the Ripple protocol, but as well to the Pana discovery messaging protocol. Now, the metric containers that are available with the Ripple has to be shared between Pana discovery messaging as well as Ripple. Anyways, currently, based on the uh, uh, so the, there is one question that is asked here: Can Ripple metrics containers be reused by another protocol? And I don't see any reason why, but I would like to take an opinion about from the working group. If someone else thinks that it cannot be reused, then we would like to know. Next slide, please. Yeah, so basically, there are some questions that we have asked here. Should we consider a signaling extension in for proactive mode, not as part of this draft, because this is this specifically is a guidelines and policy draft. And secondly, we have a question regarding how do other implementations take care of the finding out or discovering the, uh, how would the parent node come to know about the global IPv6 address of the child node? which is required for resolving the SRH header. So these are some questions that we wanted to ask the working group uh, implement if there are any implementers available. And call for, yeah. So uh, Lots of information. Um, Samita Chakrabarti, six level co-chair. Um, so I, I figured that in um, in this document or proposal, you have multiple solutions put together in one document, especially one with Ripple or Pure NDP or with Pana for distribution of your um, NC parameters. Um, to my mind, I, I'm not 100% clear about the charter of LUIG, but um i'm thinking it it may it seemed to me that it could be divided into different uh, pieces right it i i don't think you can implement it, it without any changes in either six slope and neighbor discovery or role uh, so i would say you have to probably um, present in respective groups and get some buy-in um, because um, I see there are some other work also going on, yeah. especially I know in six low, so how it, it was mentioned by um, Mohit before as well. So this is what we have thought about it and please check if it makes sense. So as part of this work, we are considering only the implementation guidelines and if there are any extensions that have to be done, then we go about according to uh, i mean whatever the working group relevant working group is for example in case of uh, if 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 the proactive approach has to be followed then we go with uh, the role working group or if there is any signaling change for that matter somewhere else then we go accordingly uh, uh, to, with that working group so as of now this draft does not make any this this is an informational Rahul, draft as of i think we're out of time so so um, i think it's good samita that you have this conversation offline with them and you can continue on the mailing list sure. and then we figure out like how to do this logistically sure. thank you very much thank okay. you thanks a lot for waiting and putting up with the uh, you know the slight stuff so thanks a lot so have a nice evening thanks then for staying up late <laughs> yes Bye. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you so much for three chanting and uh, have a good evening everybody bye take care see you soon. Bye.